again, thank you for coming to Venture Cafe Warsaw, the kickoff. And uh, I have Mike Lake here. And we're going to, so if you were part of the earlier roundtable that I did, we talked about some of the similarities and differences between uh, Poland and the U.S. as it relates to venture capital. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, the health of an ecosystem, the health of innovation districts, and where innovation is happening. And, and Mike, uh, through his company, focuses on, and I hope I don't get this wrong, but really, the, instead of an innovation district, how do we make cities smarter, mm -hmm. right? What kind of technologies can be, be deployed? And my belief is if a city is smarter, it's going to be more innovative, because it's going to attract people that have, uh, whether it's Arthur that we met earlier that has the smart benches or the, the, the sustainable benches or something along those lines, it's going to attract people that are doing creative things. So this discussion is, uh, there's not two people, it's not going to be me moderating, it's gonna be a conversation that Mike and I will have. Uh, so hopefully that's entertaining to you to watch two guys talk. Uh, <laughs> that seems very odd when I think about it that way, but we will also engage you in this as well. Uh, but Mike, can you first start talking, talk a little bit about what you do through your work? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Travis, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it's an exciting moment in uh, Venture Cafe's uh, new chapter, um, and I'm, I'm delighted to be a small part of that. Um, so Leading Cities is a global nonprofit organization. It is our mission to improve the quality of life in cities, and we do that through smart ecosystems, smart city solutions. Um, so we have a seven pillar approach uh, that involves everything from research and policy to media and events to exchanging of best practices, financing, and right at the core of it all is innovation, mm -hmm. which is probably the most relevant part uh, for this conversation and why Leading Cities enjoys a partnership with Venture Cafe. Well, I don't think people want to listen to us two guys talk about policy. So yeah, we probably, yeah. Yes, <laughs> that would be definitely really not. <laughs> um, but uh, what Venture Cafe has brought to Boston, uh, which is where I'm from and where Leading Cities is headquartered, uh, is nothing short of astounding. And, and in fact, it, its ability to um, really invigorate the innovation community. And Leading Cities is trying to do the exact same thing, but specific to smart city solutions, recognizing that there are plenty of solutions out there um, for everyday problems. Um, that you face in, a, in an urban center. Um, the term smart city solutions, I always remind people, is a relatively new term, uh, relatively meaning in the last decade or so and, and made more popular in the last few years. Um, but the concept is as old as cities. Um, I mean, running water was a smart city solution. Paved streets, street lights, traffic lights, all of these are smart city solutions. Roman aqueducts, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. it. I mean, that's what created cities, mm -hmm. uh, the ability to have that running water. So smart cities as a concept has been around forever. Um, what we're, the, the 21st century spin on it is that it's not building aqueducts, um, but it's, it's leveraging, and it doesn't have to be, uh, not every smart city solution is technology based, but it is leveraging the technology of the 21st century uh, to improve quality of life in cities. What cities are doing it well? when you look around the world? Huh, that's a great question. So um, there, there's probably, well, there are some examples. Amsterdam, Singapore, um, Barcelona are some that come to mind. They're the ones that are often at the top of a smart city ranking, which I have to say, a little plug here, there, when I started leading cities a decade ago, there were no rankings in smart cities. So we kept talking about smart cities and nobody knew who was smart and who wasn't. It's kind of like being in school talking about smart kids without grades. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, that's exactly who's it. Smart? Yeah. You don't know. And so I originally talked about creating a ranking system. We never did it and now I'm glad we didn't. There are plenty of them, number one, and I've personally come to hate all of them. <laughs> not not for the methodology, but because what I've realized about rankings is that uh, it's a zero sum game. Um, so in order for one city to move up in a ranking, another city has to be demoted. Um, and that creates a false sense of competition between cities. When leading cities is all about collaboration. It's about sharing best practices, learning from each other's uh, lessons or failures. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're actually in the process right now, uh, and we will launch in September, uh, the Leading Cities rating system, mm -hmm. modeled after the bond rating system, which is a tiered system. In an ideal world, every city reaches the top tier. Yeah. 
So coming back to your question, there are those that are recognized as smart cities. Um, but I would argue that we, we haven't really, like this planet has not yet created a smart city. We're, and part of that is recognizing that a smart city is not a destination, it is a process. Um, so it is a continuous process of improvement for cities. Um, but there is no city on the planet uh, that is fully integrated, fully equitable, uh, fully sustainable, fully resilient. Um, and that's the goal that we're all trying to achieve. In, in a stack ranking, a zero-sum game uh, with, a comp with competition at its core, I would imagine there would be less willingness to share best practices. Do you see with a more of a, a rating system or just cities wanting to get smarter, are, there sh are they sharing best practices so that one city doesn't have to recreate something from, from zero again? There, and this is actually what Leading Cities has been doing for the last 10 years. So we started with a, a, well, we launched with five cities with the goal of creating a global network of no more than 10 cities. We were focused on research and trying to collaborate with more than 10 cities is, I mean, 10 cities was chaotic enough. Sure. Um, but what we've recently done is launched a member network which is now open to all cities everywhere. Um, because there is, a, there is a genuine interest in exchanging best practices. Um, one thing I always remind our partners and now our members is that it's not just about exchanging best practices. Um, because a success in one place is not guaranteed in all right. places. What I also remind cities is that they have to share their lessons learned, their, their failures, mm -hmm. because a failure one place has a very high probability of failing elsewhere. So it's just as, if not more valuable, to know what to avoid as it is to know what to do. Um, so I believe with the rating system, it's another opportunity to draw cities in to understand the, the value of exchanging best practices and lessons learned. Um, and to, to develop a network that um, attracts not just cities, but attracts the solution providers that are looking to work with cities. So I, I have the, the benefit of traveling around the world and helping set up innovation districts in a lot of places. And I've noticed that it's become somewhat of a branding effort, hmm. right? We're going to slap the label innovation district on this part of downtown where we have an empty warehouse and we're going to paint a, a wall yellow, <laughs> and all of a sudden it's going to become an innovation district. Do you see the same thing with smart cities? Like, are people being dumb with how they're deploying the smart city brand? Are they? And is that is that create a challenge for you when you're really trying to hold people to a higher standard? I do. I think the biggest mistake when it comes to smart cities uh, are cities that use smart city as a branding or a marketing tool. Um, it's not about branding or marketing. It's not about uh, selling your city. It's about improving your city. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the biggest mistake. Um, we, we also work, in fact, in Boston. Mm -hmm. We launched an innovation district yeah. under our last mayor. And Leading Cities was instrumental in, in leading a delegation to Dublin, to uh, Barcelona, uh, to look at existing um, innovation districts and look for best mm -hmm. practices and lessons learned. Um, one of the things I've learned from that is uh, there are multiple approaches to developing an innovation district. So for instance, in Barcelona, they created the 22 at district. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a, a very organized, um, build it from the ground up. It was taking a, a part of the city that was underdeveloped and labeling it mm -hmm. an innovation district, leveraging government actually. Uh, so they moved, um, oh, I forget what, the minis Ministry of Law and, and okay. Society or something like that. But it was basically um, the legal system of, uh, of the government into that district. Um, and it sprung up a number of opportunities because mm -hmm. uh, you had law firms, law firms helping startups, startup. They worked with the universities. Uh, they created um, uh, a number of uh, programming for uh, by the city to allow startups to, whether it was a restaurant or a tech company or whatever mm -hmm. it was, to go in on a Thursday mm -hmm. um, 
And in eight hours, they would go through the entire process, permitting, licensing, hmm. whatever it was that they needed to launch. Um, so there was a, a concentrated effort on creating this district and having the programming and amenities uh, and resources necessary to really get a startup off the ground. Uh, contrast that to uh, Boston, which has had a much more organic approach, uh, although we mm -hmm. do have what is labeled an innovation district, it is primarily occupied by large corporations, mm -hmm. um, in large part because the real estate costs went so high, right. nobody else could afford it. Um, but the fact of the matter is Boston, as a whole, is, it can be considered an innovation district. Mm -hmm. So it has sprung up organically, and you have certain areas, I mean, Kendall Square, which is, right. of course, where CIC was founded, um, and so CIC being at the core of it, uh, Venture Cafe, uh, MIT, mm -hmm. and uh, the Kendall Square Association, whatnot, um, that's one pocket. Then you have over by Northeastern University, mm -hmm. you have more of a medical pocket. Uh, so you have all of these different um, clusters within the city that have sprung up organically. And then the last example I'll use is Lisbon. Hmm. So Lisbon started with, like, like Boston, kind of an organic uh, uh, springing up of mm -hmm. clusters. But then the city took the next step, which was to uh, engage in a concerted effort to link all of these different hmm. um, accelerators and incubators and startup uh, organizations. And they've, they've built a collaborative platform for all of these um, startup hubs within mm -hmm. the city to, to actually work together. Hmm. So there's a very different approach to creating yeah. an innovation district, and the same is true for creating smart cities. So um, in our earlier conversation when we were talking uh, with the, my previous guests on this, on this TV show, on, on my previous <laughs> guests in this conversation, uh, we were talking about venture capital, and uh, I know that entrepreneurs oftentimes think they need outside capital, they need you know, equity or a, some sort of debt vehicle to help their business grow. But a lot of companies can grow through revenue as mm -hmm. well. Uh, and the question I wanted to ask, or something I think would be interesting to talk about is, in a smart city model, is there room for a sandbox, right? Is there a room for cities to demonstrate and prototype, or entrepreneurs to demonstrate and prototype with cities so that it can help uh, in the proof of concept, help with product market fit, and maybe even lead to a paid pilot project with the city that could then lead to investment elsewhere. Are a lot of these smart cities creating these sandboxes where they are deploying or trying things? Some are, yes. Um, I mean, I think of Las Vegas, which is like, like a literal sandbox because it's in the <laughs> desert, but they have one section of the Fremont Street area that exactly. is like almost to a fault trying. You can just drop anything in there and they'll play with it for a while. It, there are cities that are doing it, Vegas being a good example. Um, I, you know, the, the key phrase you used is paid pilots. Yeah. Um, you know, Leading Cities has a, a global start, uh, smart city startup competition called Acela City. And what we, at least some of the prizes that uh, startups are competing for are paid pilot projects. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I look at, um, you know, to use a, a metaphor here, when it comes to startups and venture capital. Uh, if you think of it as a startup being a plane trying to take off, mm -hmm. uh, infusion of capital extends the runway mm -hmm. um, and gives that startup a, a greater uh, length of time to mm -hmm. acquire the, the uh, clients or customers yeah. that they need to become revenue generating and, and self-sustaining. Um, what a seller city is and what some of these other mm -hmm. programs can be is the lift that mm -hmm. a plane needs to get off the ground. Right. Because no matter how much venture capital you get, if you're not getting the customers, eventually you're going to run off the end of the runway. Yep. Um, so what we're working on is um, can, trying to um, explain to and get the understanding of cities that unpaid pilots, which is a favorite tool of cities, <laughs> um, is really more harmful uh, to start a smart yeah. city startups then it is a good thing now yes it's true that you can get a proof of concept but it's also di distracting uh, resources of that startup to implement something in a particular city with no financial reward which is actually shortening the runway yeah um, so I do believe that sandboxes have a, a um, 
a real opportunity, um, but there's also an opportunity cost uh, yeah. that we have to be mindful of. Well, yeah, I, I wanted to make sure that I was clear that it, it needs to really be that paid pilot because yes. it, it's, it's detrimental to the entrepreneurs. I think entrepreneurs, uh, first of all, so many entrepreneurs are asked, hey, come give a pitch, which is also distracting them from what yep. they're trying to do. They might get a slice of pizza out of it, but that might be about it. Uh, or worse yet, they're asked to do these paid pilots. Uh, I think of it like in the creative world where you ask a graphic designer to design a logo because it will be good exposure, right? Like That's this, exactly right. It's this, uh, this, this myth, this lie that we're, we're telling people. And that exposure, that talent costs money. Uh, what, what, what are some things that Warsaw could be doing? And I'm not sure, I don't know enough about the Warsaw ecosystem to know what it's doing in the smart cities area, but as you, as you, have, you know, look around globally, what are some things that you say, you know, if a city wants to start, here are a few places. For smart cities specific yeah, or smart innovation city, no, in smart general? smart cities specific. Uh, you know, the biggest success factor when it comes to deploying smart city mm -hmm. solutions is really leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, that re refers to city leadership, but it also refers to um, just general leadership within the community. So whether you're talking about a chamber of commerce or you're talking about civic associations or whatnot, um, understanding that uh, collectively, they have the ability to move the needle in, in terms of smartness of, of any city. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the first things I would, uh, well, actually, I should say Poland has a number of programs right now um, where there is funding available for cities who are seeking to implement smart city solutions. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, it's taking advantage of those. But and, and by the way, some of those funding programs that help create a smart city strategy. And that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. um, because without a strategy, um, cities can you know, have these one-off projects, but they're not creating a smart city. They're, they're implementing smart city projects, and those two things are not yeah. equal. They're bolting technology onto things, the, right? Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. And without a strategy, you don't you can't see the forest from the trees. Yeah. Um, so for instance, one example, um, smart street, uh, smart LED street lights. Yeah. Um, that's probably one of the lowest hanging fruit on the smart city mm -hmm. solutions uh, tree. Um, and part of that is because uh, it has a short payback period, roughly mm -hmm. two years. Um, and you can make a business case for mm -hmm. it uh, on the city side. So those projects are being done. Um, now, the reality is that one of the largest costs of changing your light bulbs mm -hmm. is the labor cost of putting somebody in a truck, driving that truck to a yeah. light post, putting them up the post, having them change it, come back down, yeah. drive to the next one. You know, the, the cost of sensor technology has dropped so dramatically mm -hmm. that for, I mean, pennies on the dollar, you can implement, while you're still up in that same bucket mm -hmm. truck, uh, replacing a light bulb, you can be adding um, air quality control, uh, mm -hmm. air quality monitoring sensors. You can be, uh, this is more an issue in the US than it is in Europe, but gunshot detection. Yeah. You can be looking at uh, parking um, solu sensors. So there's a number of, of added um, items that you can uh, put up there and you're only paying one person to go up one right. time. Uh, so the marginal cost is, is limited. Um, if you don't have a strategy, even if you're not turning on all those devices and using them mm -hmm. on the, the very next day, at least they're there and you know that they're part of your strategy rather than going back and, and developing this a second time. And, and one of the things we found at Leading Cities is that cities will quickly start to, the cities that want to become smarter will start to develop a strategy. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the reality is they don't always know where to begin. Mm -hmm. So we've actually developed a, uh, the Leading Cities Assessment mm -hmm. tool, which is a web-based tool. It involves stakeholders from around the community um, so purposely engaging stakeholders from the beginning to get their perspective and to get their buy-in mm -hmm. in this. Um, but it identifies in five different categories from um, governance and leadership to uh, I ICT solutions. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's very much inward looking into the city. Does the city have the organizational structure it needs to actually sure. pursue smart city projects? And we also, once you go through the process, you not only get your, your own answers on your city, you have the opportunity to benchmark against other cities and look at global best practices, use cases, case studies. Um, 
And so it really lays the foundation for developing a smart city strategy. Mm -hmm. So those would be my recommendations on how to actually start, mm -hmm. rather than just racing towards implementing streetlights, yeah. uh, smart streetlights. I think the downside is people are going around selling streetlights and like there's, there's, there's a Correct. biz dev person for all the smart city tools <laughs> that are going out there saying, buy this, buy this, buy this. Uh, questions from uh, the crew that's here, anything that you would like to know? Uh, yeah. Faster, right? Yeah. Um, what are the strategies of the cities? Of the, because now you're mentioning there are all these different tools, but actually it's important how they fit into the bigger strategy of the city and the, fu and the future development. So in case of those three cities, what are the strategies actually they are pursuing? So they're all slightly different. Um, in, in Lisbon, um, I would say Lisbon took... Well, I'll start with Barcelona, actually, because they took the first step in terms of taking pretty much blank space and creating something. So their strategy was... Uh, focused on how do you use the space that's underutilized in the city. Um, and they realized that, um, that innovation was a real key piece to this. Um, and what they also did extremely well, which links in the smart cities piece, is they took government um, offices and they started relocating them in the worst parts of the city. Um, so, in worse meaning, you know, more depressed neighborhoods and, and whatnot, and started to bring uh, more economic development opportunities to those parts of the city. Um, so it was very much, a, I would say, an economic development focused strategy. Um, in Lisbon, uh, Lisbon was, was named uh, entrepreneurship capital of, of Europe. Um, they recognized that there was a lot happening in the ecosystem and that the city was pretty disconnected from it um, initially. And so their strategy was, how does the city get more connected uh, to this ecosystem so that it can support and help advance the, the ecosystem? Um, so like I said before, they developed this platform. They went out and mapped all of the, the various resources available to, to startups. Um, and in so doing, created what I would consider to be a smart city solution. Um, in the case of Boston, I'm sad to say, <laughs> I think it was less strategic. Um, I mean, we had uh, just over a thousand un or underdeveloped acres in the core of downtown. Uh, it was waterfront property. It was the largest space in, in the entire east coast of the U.S. Um, in a city that was underutilized. Uh, so it was a huge opportunity, a complete blank canvas. Um, and unfortunately, um, I, I, the city's lack of a... I mean, they labeled it innovation district, to your, yeah. to your point, just slapping There's a label a district on hall something. There, yeah, there, there is, is a district yeah, hall, is, yeah. which is actually probably one of the most significant components of that district in terms of innovation. Right. Yeah. Um, the rest of it was really focused on development opportunities. So real estate developers came in. They built your, you know, steel and glass buildings, mm -hmm. um, beautiful views of the water, um, and, and it became high, the high rent district. Um, so it, it, unfortunately, the lack of a strategy really forced out uh, the innovation that mm -hmm. they were hoping to bring in. Um, and um, we, I do have to, we're gonna have to bust, uh, break it there because we, we have another group that's about to come sure. in. Sure. Uh, one beauty, beautiful thing about Venture Cafe is that uh, this is, it, there are different industries that are represented at, at Venture Cafe. And I think in, if a city is going to get smarter, it's not going to just go to the streets department or the water department or the engineers or the computer programmers or the Internet of Things uh, you know, builders. It is going to take a broad approach. And so what I want to encourage people to do during Venture Cafe, if you are interested in smart cities work, one, continue to you know, have a conversation with Mike, but also find people that are from different disciplines and say, what happens if you get uh, a social entrepreneur, a computer programmer, a school teacher, and a government bureaucrat together to think about the future of a city? That's how cities really get smarter. That's how innovation districts actually get built, is by getting a cross-section of people. And we try to demonstrate that every time we do Venture Cafe. So big round of applause for Mike. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much, Travis. Yeah. All right, get out there and continue to uh, serendipitously collide. We'll uh, make room for the next group coming in. Thanks. Thank you.